So as students, faculty, and staff at MIT, I'm sure most of you are worried about time often. I know I am. Uh, most days I'm worried if I'll make it to my next meeting on time. Uh, today I'm worried if I'll finish this presentation on time. Um, but as someone who looks at fusion materials, I'm worried about the short time that we have before fusion reactors exist and what materials we're actually going to build them with. So these materials will be in very extreme conditions relative to old reactors. And it's about time that we found materials that work. So to see this challenge, we can look no further than MIT's ARC reactor. This is a pilot fusion power plant, which needs to put electricity on the grid. And it needs to do this where it lasts. So the materials need to last. It makes use of high temperature superconducting magnets to be much smaller than previous reactor designs. But this means that the first wall and vacuum vessel materials will be at very high heat loads and very high radiation loads. So let's think about a material timeline going forward. We know that CO2 emissions need to decline to net zero by about 2050. So this means that we need large scale fusion power on the grid by 2050. This means that a good realistic timeline for first arc would be roughly 2035. So working our way back, we know that fabrication will take a few years. These are large scale components with complex geometries. And if it takes a long time to build these components with materials with which we're already familiar, then if we don't know what material we're building it with, it can take even longer. So we need to account for this time. And this fabrication time can be rather inflexible. So working our way back further, we know that we need to put materials in arc that have already been exposed to neutron irradiation. After all, this is the best indicator for what a neutron, a neutron irradiation environment like arc will be. But we have a dilemma. Arc vacuum vessel is pro projected to have roughly a 40 DPA per year dose rate. Current uh, access to fast reactors only gives us roughly an 8 DPA per year dose rate. This is a unit of radiation damage. This means we only have time to do a neutron irradiation once. So this, along with post irradiation characterization, is going to take up the majority of our timeline leading up to 2035. So we need to think about how to speed this up. And we can use ion irradiation to actually speed up these irradiations for testing materials. So what I'm showing here is 100 ion irradiations in a fraction of the time that it takes to do one neutron irradiation in a fast reactor. The good thing about this is we can do these irradiations here at MIT on Albany Street in the class accelerator. But this is just one side of the coin. We have fast irradiations, and now we need fast tests. After all, there are several failure mecha mechanisms that exist for fusion materials, so we need to consider them all. So let's look at a few examples. One way that materials can fail is through precipitation at grain boundaries. So this is showing a heat pipe that was overheated, precipitates formed at grain boundaries, and then it eventually failed because of crack nucleation. This can also be seen with precipitation during irradiation. So this is titanium oxide precipitates at grain boundaries after a steel was irradiated in a reactor. Helium accumulation is also an issue. So what I'm showing here is a nickel alloy that was irradiated. And then these fine lines are what separated helium bubbles at grain boundaries. And these fine lines are actually the only material connecting grains together. So if we think about our material as paper, you want it to remain rigid, not pull apart. But if you have these fine perforations of material that's connecting neighboring grains by only small amounts, you might want to throw this material in the trash, or maybe flush it. <laughs> What we're also concerned with is volumetric void swelling. So what I'm showing here are Bohr 60 fast reactor fuel assembly wrappers. And these were irradiated to roughly the arc relevant doses. And they experienced nearly 30% void swelling. So this volumetric change is obviously a big issue. But even more so, they became so brittle at these high swelling rates that when they tried to remove them from the reactor, they were so brittle they just shattered like glass. So we know that these failure mechanisms are related to actual physical changes in the materials. It's helium accumulation, precipitation, or voids forming. And we can actually track the materials 
uh, direct properties of interest to see or infer how these failure mechanisms might evolve or how these physical changes might evolve. So this is with properties like strength, ductility, thermal conductivity. I'm showing over here uh, tensile specimens um, because these are used to calculate strength and ductility. But the issue with this is we can't use these during ion irradiation to high doses because ions only penetrate a certain depth into the material. So what we can use instead are tests that give us correlated properties of interest, that give us information about how this microstructure might be changing quickly and that can be used with ion irradiation. So this brings me to transient grading spectroscopy, or TGS. It's a method that our group has sort of pioneered here at MIT, and um, we use it to calculate thermal diffusivity and surface acoustic wave speed. So let me explain how it works. So TGS uses a pump laser, or two pump lasers that are intersected on the surface of a sample, and through constructive and destructive interference, it forms a periodic power grading that looks something like this. So because we're depositing power periodically like this, this gives rise to a surface grating through therm thermal expansion. We can actually measure the decay of this grating with a probe laser. So what I'm going to show here is the decay of this grating, and it'll oscillate up and down to represent these surface acoustic waves. And then I'll show you what a raw signal looks like as it's happening. So from this signal, we can extract those properties that I mentioned earlier thermal diffusivity, and surface acoustic wave speed from the oscillations in the signal. Now what makes this technique so powerful is that it can be used in situ during ion irradiation because it's non-contact and non-destructive. A single measurement only takes a few seconds. So over the course of a whole day, you can test this material thousands of times, and you can get a very good curve on the property changes with ion irradiation to high doses. So let's circle back to those failure mechanisms and see how it actually changes. So what I'm showing over here on the left is precipitation after irradiation in some nickel alloy. And when we look at a similar alloy with TGS, as we irradiate it, what we see is the emergence of a second peak in the frequency of these surface acoustic waves. What this tells us is that we have a new phase or a new material in the matrix of the previously existing material. So different waves travel at different speeds in different materials. This is really powerful because we can see the, at specific radiation conditions uh, the way that materials evolve. We can also look at helium accumulation. So what I'm showing over here is thermal diffusivity as measured by TGS with uh, different concentrations of helium implanted into tungsten. And this is really useful because we can measure property changes, direct property changes that we're interested in and see the influence of these relevant, arc-relevant helium concentrations. Now, previous methods like transmission electron microscopy that have been used to study helium in materials, although they're very useful for visualizing where helium is, it takes a very long time to prepare these samples as compared to TGS where we can measure these samples in minutes. So for this last one, we can actually look at soft speed and how it changes versus peak dose to observe volumetric void swelling in materials. Now what we see when we irradiate them is first you see an, an increase in the surface acoustic wave speed with minimal swelling, but then with increasing dose and increasing porosity due to void swelling, we see a continuous decrease in soft speed. This is consistent across many different materials. Now this experiment was done ex situ, so born, before and after irradiation. But like I said, now we have the capabilities to do these during irradiation. So now we can go from an experiment that looks like this to one that looks like this, where we have much better sampling rate so we can get the properties at a much higher frequency during irradiation, and a single experiment only takes a matter of hours rather than weeks. So if you give me a material, I can test it in a day, tell you where it relatively swells, and then if you give me another material the next day, and I run the exact same ion radiation conditions, I can tell you which material has better void swelling resistance given specific ion irradiation conditions and at a specific temperature. Now we're increasing our capabilities at MIT. Uh, by the end of the year, we hope to finish building an in-situ TGS system on the class accelerator. Uh, and this will be in parallel with the Dionysus plasma exposure device. This way we'll be able to test not only 
the vacuum vessel materials, but also the first wall materials, so they can be, ex be exposed to ion irradiation and plasma exposure. So what I've shown you is that the time leading up to 2035 is rather rigid. We have fabrication, which takes too much time. We have neutron irradiation, which takes too much time. But in the next few years, we can use ion irradiation, a very fast method for irradiating materials, and TGS, which is a very fast method for testing materials, and we can rule down to a small subset of materials that we can pass off into this neutron irradiation phase. And it's about time that we found these materials. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. So with TGS, what can you say about, um, you, have, you showed like the sample that have been like stretched and the, some of the mechanical properties. So then you had the acoustic wave speed. So what can you say about those other mechanical properties with TGS? Sure. So if we're using TGS to probe materials, we can see, like I mentioned, the void swelling and precipitation. Um, so these tell us about the ductility of the material, because if you have Swelling to the extent, like I showed with the Bohr 60 uh, fuel assemblies, they become very brittle at high degree of swelling. So if you know which materials will swell at higher doses, you can assume that those would be more ductile and then therefore less likely to fracture. One question from, from myself. Mm -hmm. If you are thinking of what material to measure this vessel, what would that material to be? As a potential fusion structural material? Right. Um, so we're looking at a lot. Uh, the, the proposed vacuum vessel material for ARC was Inconel 718, so we're testing several nickel alloys. Um, we're also looking at vanadium alloys and several different steels, so all of which are very exciting. Great. So are there any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.